We all sit here thinking that we know everything about magnesium, but there are all these unknown benefits that are out there in the research world, but aren't making it out to the general public. So I've got five very unknown benefits of magnesium. Okay, so the first one, metabolically, insulin resistance, probably the most powerful one. And if you watch any one out of the five, I think this one is probably the most important that we can all take away from. They're all important, but this was published in the journal Nutrients. It took a look at 234 people that had metabolic syndrome. So mitochondrial dysfunction, they were maybe obese, they were maybe diabetic, poor glucose management, whatever. So four times per year, they measured their magnesium intake, but also their HOMA IR, which is basically their levels of insulin resistance. Well, they found the highest quartile of magnesium intake ended up having a 71% reduction in developing an elevated level of insulin resistance. So a 71% reduction in essentially the risk of developing insulin resistance compared to the lowest magnesium intake. So the people that consumed a lot of magnesium basically did not develop insulin resistance nearly as much as the people that did not consume much magnesium. Then there was another study that was published in the journal Diabetes Care that looked at almost 4,500 people. This one was really interesting because it found very similar things. They found over the course of 20 years, with a 20 year follow-up, that subjects that consumed more magnesium, there ended up being an inverse correlation between magnesium intake and their inflammation levels, C-reactive protein, but also magnesium intake along with their HOMA IR, their insulin resistance. In fact, they found that there was a 47% less chance of developing type 2 diabetes in the group that consumed the highest amount of magnesium over the course of 20 years. Now we have to ask the question why this is potentially happening. And without getting into the weeds too much, essentially what is happening is we have these chemical signals and we have electrical signals that occur in the pancreas when we produce insulin. Now the chemical signal is when glucose hits the pancreatic beta cell or triggers the pancreatic beta cell. Then the electrical signal has to do with calcium and magnesium, and basically you have these channels that open and close. And calcium will make that channel close. Magnesium essentially allows it to relax and open. If that is disrupted because magnesium levels are low, then you're disrupting the chemical signal and how it affects the electrical signal. That electrical signal, if it's disrupted, will impede the release of insulin from the pancreatic beta cell. So at a very fundamental electrical level, you're not producing insulin, thereby leading to more insulin resistance, right? So when magnesium is sufficient, this can happen the way it's supposed to. Okay, now I wanna move into this next one surrounding the world of headaches, which really is something that may not seem like it's important, but when you think about fundamentally what's happening in the brain when you hear this, it is very important. Before I get into that, I put a link down below for Thrive Market because they have a bunch of different foods that are rich in magnesium if you wanna check them out. But I figure anyone that's watching this video is probably at least grocery shopping. So Thrive is a huge sponsor on this channel. They support a lot of the content we create. And because of that, there's a 30% off discount link. So you save 30% off your entire first grocery order with Thrive Market and then you also can get a $50 free gift when you use that link down below. So 30% off your groceries plus a $50 free gift, plus you get everything delivered to your doorstep. Thrive Market makes it super, super, super easy. You can literally look at the nutrition facts, you can look at the ingredients, you can see what's rich in magnesium, what's not. You can sort by diet type, paleo, keto, vegan. It, it makes shopping so easy and then it's at your doorstep. So that link down below for 30% off and a free gift. Okay, so when you look at a lot of observational stuff with headaches, you find that lower serum levels of magnesium tend to equate to higher levels or instances of migraines and headaches. Okay, well, let's look at some more. There was a study that was published in the journal Cephalogia that took a look at 12 weeks of 600 milligrams of magnesium consumption on people that had migraines versus placebo. That's a fair bit. What they found is that during weeks nine to 12, there was a 41.6% reduction in attack frequency. Their migraine and headache attacks were 41% less frequent. So we're looking at magnesium as a pretty big player or magnesium deficiency as a big player when it comes to migraines. And a lot of this has to do with relaxing the brain, kind of decreasing the excitatory effects of calcium and things like that. When our calcium and magnesium are out of balance, the brain gets lit up and it seems as though the excitatory response within like these different synapses could potentially trigger a migraine, although it's still in question as to what goes on, but it looks like magnesium works. Now, playing along that same vein, if you or someone you know and love is a smoker that's trying to quit, 
magnesium could be hugely beneficial. There was a study published in Magnesium Research looked at 53 individuals that were serious smokers, serious problems, like we're talking 10 cigarettes or more per day. So they actually admitted them into a psychiatric hospital, okay? So once they're in the psychiatric hospital, they co-administered magnesium alongside a benzodiazepine or just a benzodiazepine. What they found is that the subjects that had the co-administration of magnesium alongside a benzo ended up having or consuming or smoking significantly less cigarettes after 28 days than the group that only had the benzo. So the reason that this is possibly working is nicotine works upon the GABA pathway, gamma aminobutyric acid. It sort of blocks GABA in a way. So when you have nicotine, you're blocking this GABA, getting this excited response, and then you kind of have a flood of GABA. You're basically having a GABA inhibitory effect. Well, it looks as though magnesium, since it sits on a particular receptor called the NMDA receptor, when magnesium occupies this receptor, it blocks the glutamate from hitting it. So what that means is you're actually blocking the GABAergic inhibition of nicotine. So nicotine stops GABA, GABA makes you relaxed. So nicotine is stopping that relaxation, forcing you to be like, ah, I like that, I need that. Okay, magnesium stops that effect. So you have less of a good feeling from it. Very fascinating stuff there. Which leads us into the next one, because it has to do with smoking, but it's totally different in this case, lung function. We wouldn't think that magnesium could benefit our lungs, but check this research out. There was a study published in the Lancet that took a look at over 2,600 people. And what they did is they measured their magnesium intake, and they also measured what is called forced expiratory volume. Okay, that's how much they can exhale in one second. How many milliliters of air can they exhale? So they looked at people and they found the average was about 380 milligrams of magnesium per day. Not a bad amount, but they found when there was a 100 milligram per day increase in magnesium, there was a 27.7 milliliter increase in forced expiratory volume in one second, meaning people were able to exhale that much more. That's a large number just by increasing magnesium 100 points. Now, or 100 milligrams rather. But when we look at this, we have to ask ourselves why. And the most basic answer is, again, magnesium having the relaxation effect on the muscles. We forget that muscles are still involved in breathing, okay? So when we have that breath and we take that relaxation into consideration, that's what allows us to breathe and also exhale. So at the bronchial level, if calcium is too high and magnesium is low, you have this contraction that's occurring and it's not letting up. So that is the probably the best explanation as to how forced expiratory volume could be increased. And now we jump into the final one. Magnesium is required for vitamin D at multiple levels. Okay, first of all, magnesium is required for vitamin D to turn into calcidiol, to turn into its like usable form that's actually bioavailable. Put that aside for a second. Magnesium is also required for a vitamin D receptor. So if you do not have the vitamin D receptor, vitamin D can't bind and do its job. There's a study that was published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition with a pretty decent amount of people, 180 people, okay, and they found that when they were given magnesium supplementation, it would actually increase their vitamin D levels if their vitamin D levels were already low, okay? So if they were less than 30 nanograms per deciliter and they had magnesium, it would increase their vitamin D. On the contrary, if their vitamin D levels were already high or possibly even too high, taking in magnesium actually dropped their vitamin D levels because magnesium seems to have a modulating effect on where our vitamin D levels should be because it's involved in the formation of the receptor or the gene expression to build the receptor. So it's very fundamental for not having too much vitamin D and for making sure we have adequate amounts of vitamin D. So what's the proper amount of magnesium for you to take in? I generally recommend between four and 800 milligrams. If you're more active, be on the higher side because it is one of those minerals that you will excrete. If you're doing a lower carb protocol, you wanna have that number be towards the upper end of that too because you're excreting more in your urine, okay? But it's one of these things where you do wanna be continually getting it throughout the day. You don't wanna just take a bunch of magnesium bolus at night or rotate the times and day in which you take it because hydration levels matter. So what I usually recommend is if you take 500 milligrams at night, then the next day try taking 500 milligrams at lunch, then take it with breakfast. Rotate them up a little bit so you're kinda of saturating and getting the effect upon different periods of time. So as always, keep it locked in here on my channel. See you tomorrow.